Okay, well, don't all just be quiet now. <laughs> oh my gosh. You started recording, so we need to, you know, oh, 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 I don't want to hear this on the play ourselves. Oh, 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 oh. I don't even know how to turn it off. <laughs> to the bottom, Dr. Terrell, where it says record. The bottom, the bottom. <laughs> uh, share a screen. I know how to share my screen. DVD. Uh, screen. Hey, Dr. T. Hello, Pauline. How are you? Hi, how are you? Good. Um, Lily said that she'll be late because she's going to the pet hospital to pick up her cat. I'm willing to sacrifice her cat. <laughs> Hi, Dr. T. This is recorded. <laughs> In case you forgot. <laughs> I, I'm, I guess I'm glad you mentioned it. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't have noticed. That's the shame of it all. You know, that's the shame for me. Uh, let's see. Okay. We find, okay, so I can exit this thing full screen. There we go. Okay, this thing a genie. Okay. So, as you may notice by my wonderfully prepared notes, I did not prepare notes. I'm using canned notes from, uh, from Harris. Um, and we're going to talk about capillary electrophoresis. And then we're going to go on and we're going to talk about a paper In capillary in the area of capillary electrophoresis um, called high-speed capillary electrophoresis using thin-walled fused silica capillary and backscatter interferometry, both of which I pretty much know what they are. So that's a good thing. And uh, let let us chat now about. Um, capillary electrophoresis. So um, who here knows what capillary electrophoresis is? Show of hands. Adam, Kenya. Okay, all right, I got a couple of you. So um, uh, capillary electrophoresis is um, the that's an interesting story about heparin. Uh, but um, capillary electrophoresis is uh, uses a capillary and a power supply, you know, and two reservoirs, right? And basically, you can apply a potential between these two reservoirs. Really, you're applying a current. This current is what drives this whole thing, right? But in order to get any current to flow, you need about 30,000 volts. So it's a, it's a, it's a very volty situation. You might even say that it's revolting. Dan smiled, Dan, I saw you smiled. You got a slight smile on your face. Aditya, you're, you're, you have to turn the, the sun off. Ah, there we go. There we go. Now we can see you. Oh, no. Okay, all right. I get it. 
So, um, uh, so basically, if you apply a voltage between these two um, little uh, beakers here, uh, liquid will, uh, you know, the buffer, basically the electrolyte in, in that's contained in this capillary, uh, will flow between one reservoir and the other. It will literally move mass along one direction, right? And uh, uh, normally the, uh, the mass flows from, let's see, it's gonna follow the cations. The cations are gonna go from the plus to the minus, right? And it's gonna go in the direction of flow indicated here. Um, I'm so glad I didn't say it was the opposite, right? Because, um, because I know how it works. I can predict this, right? Um, the, and uh, there's a couple of variants here, but um, you have to use a, an electrolyte, meaning a solution with plus and minus ions that are free, right? And it also has to be pH buffered. That's very important too. Okay, and I'll explain that in just a second. Come on. There we go. Oops. Oh, wait. So here we go. So, um, so in practice, what you do is you um, is you take this end and you dip it into a um, a sample vial, right? And then you you apply a little bit of pressure, usually gas pressure. And then you just need a little, just get a little bit of flow because it's, there's a lot of resistance in this 50 micron column, right? So um, you apply it pressure and then you just get a little bit of the sample to flow in, you know, maybe a microliter or so. And then you, um, and then you take the capillary out and put it back into the electrolyte, then turn on the juice, right? And, um, and then what happens is um, uh, the electric field makes an electroosmotic flow, right? The electroosmotic flow um, carries all the ions and neutrals uh, through the um, uh, through the column and to the detector, and um, uh, you know, uh, typically you use um, uh, some spectrophotometric detector. You know, so you measure the the light transmitted through the column right near the end here. The idea is that while this flow of liquid is going through the capillary, there's also an electric field. And the electric field basically acts on three things. The bulk of the water, then the anions individually and the cations individually, and then the neutrals, which just go with the water, uh, uh, unless you do other things. So, um, and then you plot the detector signal versus time, and that is an electrophorogram. All right. So um, uh, now, if you compare this to chromatography, you get um, much narrower peaks. All right. Um, if you recall from the um, uh, undergraduate analytical chemistry course, which you took or didn't take, um, there's an equation for the plate height in chromatography. And the plate height is um, the badness, the, uh, the larger the plate height, the, the broader the peaks come out, right? And so there's a multiple path term, which is zero in the case of uh, cap capillary electrochromatography. 
because there's not a tortuous pathway. Like in, in chromatography, the, the analytes have to flow around little uh, particles. And so that, that creates a broadening, which is absent in, in capillary electrophoresis. You have um, a longitudinal diffusion term, B, and a mass transfer kinetics term, C. And C is zero because you're not, you're not partitioning these analytes into anything, right? There's no, um, there's no, uh, uh, there's no retention of anything in the column, right? So A and C are both zero. So the only real factor in determining, in determining the, the broadening is the time that it takes the stuff to elute. And this term here, this B term is for, it's called longitudinal diffusion. And longitudinal meaning along the length of the capillary. It's how much the zone that you put in, how much it spreads over time with the, separ with the uh, separation. So, um, uh, so it's pretty cool. I mean, you can see here in this example, uh, there's a 4,000 plate HPLC separation. And this peak takes, um, you know, a good, uh, you know, 50 seconds or so, maybe 40 seconds, if, you know, from the time that it starts rising, to the time that it stops falling, right? That's between five point, you know, eight, and six point, you know, six minutes here, right? But the uh, capillary electrophoresis plate is about a hundred thousand plates, and it's done in um, literally, you know, maybe twenty seconds, maybe 10, ten to twenty seconds. And so that means that capillary electrophoresis compared to HPLC gives narrower peaks. So that's why there's interest in it for a separation method in general. Although, as you'll see going forward, there are some uh, Achilles heels. Um, so, um, blah, blah, blah. It makes more, it makes more um, plates. Okay, so um, the uh, what what happens in electrophoresis column is you get um, uh, there's one of the terms in determining how fast uh, an analyte gets through the column is the electrophoretic mobility, and um, and uh, Basically, um, the, uh, the electrophoretic mobility here, it's a balance between uh, the driving force from the, from the voltage and then the frictional force that the ion experiences in solution. And so there's Fu and Qe. The Qe is the force pulling it forward. And Fu, nothing personal, but Fu is the uh, force pulling it back, which is a frictional force, you know? So when it reaches um, this terminal velocity, it has Qe uh, equal to Fu. Again, nothing personal. I like saying that for some reason. I suppose it shows that I've, I'm still five years old, basically. So, um, uh, so when these are equal, um, then you've got this uh, QE over F, right? QE over F is equal to UEP, right? And um, I don't know what the hell I'm saying here, um, but the there's a there's an equilibrium velocity. It's equal to UEP times E, right? And that's the, called the electrophoretic mobility. And the electrophoretic mobility is um, 
uh, you know, it's larger for more charge, right? So if you have this, um, benzene tricarboxylic acid here, um, then, and you change the pH, so that's that first you deprotonate one, then two, then all three of them. And you can look at the electrophoretic mobility and it starts at 10 to the minus, uh, like three times seven, or two and a half times seven minus eight, goes to, uh, almost five and then almost six, you know? It doesn't quite scale exactly with charge, but you know, you get the idea. So um, there, these are large steps in electrophoretic mobility. <clears throat> and, um, you know, one of the reasons that this is not exactly trivial to pin down is that uh, this experiment can't actually be done in a CE because there's another term here called electroosmotic flow, which, which will account for momentarily. But um, so you can see that electrophoretic mobility is proportional to charge. The larger the charge, the larger the magnitude of UEP, right? The electrophoretic mobility, UEP. All right. So um, if you're, uh, if you're um, if your molecule is spherical, then the frictional uh, force it experiences is equal to six pi eta r, where eta is the viscosity of the solution, and so um, mu EP equals Q over F is equal to Q over six pi eta r. Right, so. Um, that means that for the larger the ion, the larger the radius, the less the um, electrophoretic mobility. So Q here is the charge and R is the radius. And these are the two major determining factors in uh, the uh, total electrophoretic mobility that a molecule experiences. And this is just in solution, right? This is in this is an ion in a liquid with an electric field. And it's gonna zip along the field lines in this direction with this velocity, right? So um, now the thing that actually makes uh, capillary electrophoresis work is called um, electroosmotic flow. And electroosmotic flow originates um, at the silica, electrolyte wall here. And so this is, this, um, in this uh, foil here, this gray rectangle represents silica, which is SiO2. And silica there has SiO uh, moieties that are bound to the surface, right? And SiO that's bound to the surface means it has a, you know, the surface has an overall negative charge, right? Now this is true because, you know, silica, silica like most materials, it just can't become negative and positive like equally, right? That's one of the weird things about chemistry, right? Chemistry is asymmetric and cool in that way, right? So you've got SiOH, right, on the surface of silica. Those are called silanols, right? And at normal pH, what happens is that O deprotonates, and you get SiO minus. So on the capillary wall, you have a fixed layer of negative charge, such that when you fill that capillary, the solution that goes in will have on average a net positive charge. Does that make sense? So Calvin, I have a question for you. If I had a, a different material, material other than silica, 
which tended to take on a positive charge, right? Say it's a trimethyl ammonium group on the surface of this, uh, of this um, plastic capillary, right? And I flow liquid into this capillary. What will the charge of the plug of liquid that fills that capillary be? Oh, can you repeat your question, Dr. T? Sure. Um, is my audio screwed up because I don't have my stupid headset? A little, a little bit. I can barely hear you. Oh, my God. Oh, I hate this. The, the stupid headset vanished. It vanished. Ah. So um, the question I'm posing to Calvin here is... If we did capillary electrophoresis in, in a weird kind of plastic, right? And this plastic had a positive surface charge. And then you filled up this, this 50 micron capillary with liquid. And the, the, the surface of the capillary has a positive charge. And what would the sign of the charge on the bulk of the liquid be in the capillary? Would it be, um, would it be negative, right? Right, exactly. There's, you know, you, you, you can't really violate charge neutrality that much, you know? <laughs> so the fixed charges on the capillary wall determine the charge on the liquid in the capillary, right? It's a funny thing. And it's like, it's not important in large tubes, right? Because the surface to volume ratio is very small in a larger tube. But in a, in a smaller capillary of around 50 microns, the amount of charge on the surface is large relative to the volume in that tube. Check me if I'm wrong here. I think I'm right. Surface to volume ratio, and a small capillary is larger than a smaller capillary, right? So in a silica capillary, um, the uh, surface charge is negative. Then there's a diffuse layer that's positive, right? And actually the majority of the charge in the solvent, in the solution, is in what's called the diffuse layer near the surface, right? So you have, you have a capillary tube with negative charges on the wall, then you've got a layer of solution near the wall that is positively charged. And then as you move in towards the center of the capillary, that positively charged, come, that positive charge kind of dissipates, right? So this is called an electrical double layer. It's just in a, in a weird, it's in a tube, right? So what happens when you apply a field across the stupid thing? Well, <laughs> you get, you know, immediately ions start to flow when you apply it, when you apply an electrical uh, uh, voltage through the, across this capillary, right? But <clears throat> the, um, the surface charges, they feel a force they don't move, <laughs> right? However, the diffuse layer feels a force and moves, right? So because the diffuse layer moves along the edge, it carries the entire solution with it. And um, it when it does this, it creates what's called plug-like flow, right? This is a weird underlined word here that um, Microsoft does not recognize because plug-like is a word that only chemists know, only good electrochemists know, separation scientists, because a plug is like a cylinder, like a little cylinder, you know? It's not and it's square on the edges. You know, a cylinder, it goes around, but on the edges, it's square, right? So a plug has square edges. Yeah, 
So when you, um, I'm gonna mute Lily. Ha, ah, sorry, Lily, I muted you. So when, when uh, this plug of solvent goes into the capillary, it has a beautiful flow profile illustrated by this type of thing, right? As um, uh, in an electroosmotic flow setting, 0, 66, and 165 seconds, right? This is how um, the, the flow through the capillary changes the distribution of stuff in the capillary. And you notice it just broadens a little bit and it's still uniform pretty much, you know? However, if you take the same capillary and you pump the flow, then you get what's called laminar flow. And laminar flow, while beautiful, makes for broad peaks, right? So here we've got, uh, you know, the, the same starting, actually better starting conditions here. And then as we pump it, the, the center of the fluid in the center of the um, capillary moves faster than the fluid at the edges. That's basically laminar flow, right? There's a lamina, that's stagnant near the wall. And then the lamina, as they move towards the center, become more and more mobile and you, know, you get more flow through, them, right? So you can look at these pictures. You can also look at this uh, flow profile here, which shows just a line going vertically for the electroosmotic flow profile and a big old bullet shaped thing for the laminar flow profile. And if this, if this is, you know, a, 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 a bunch of ions that you're trying to, to detect, you can, as, as they go by the detector there, bonk, bonk, they'll give, they'll give a sort of a, a squarish um, shape, you know, well, relative to this thing, right? They'll be more dilute at the edges, right? But, um, but this will give a very narrow peak relative to this. So, so that is the cool thing about electroosmosis, right? About the capillary electrophoresis. Um, who here knows? Who here knows something about gel electrophoresis, or who has had some exposure to gel electrophoresis? Yeah, Kenya, Adam, Richard, maybe a little bit. Um, oops, no, I gotta come here. And go all the page. Aha. Yeah, hemo, yeah, to identify hemoglobin variants, yeah. Yeah, and the run times, you know, they can go up to like, you know, I don't know, maybe an hour or something. Um, for um, for capital, uh, for uh, gel electrophoresis, and those experiments are very very high plate count. You know they're very efficient, right? So um, uh, uh, that that's really cool, you know. But it, in order to do this in in a capillary, uh, that that's kind of like part of the the goal. And this is to do it in a capillary. <clears throat> escapes me a little bit as to why now, but basically you can reuse a capillary, you know, but once you use a gel, it's kind of toast. I don't know. I could be wrong there. But um, anyhow, um, so electroosmotic flow is unique to capillaries, right? It does not happen in, in, a, in a gel, in a free gel electrophoresis experiment. And there, there could be some electroosmotic flow, right? If the gel is charged, then that will create a bulk flow of liquid through it. But it's, I don't really know if that's a, 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 like desirable in a gel electrophoresis experiment or not. 
in 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 a in a gel, you're relying just on the electrophoretic mobility of the different ions to separate them, right? That is their charge divided by their size. It's a charge over size thing, right? And you have that in capillary electrophoresis. The capillary electrophoresis also has this um, electroosmosis profile here, okay? So um, the electroosmotic mobility is, uh, it, it gives a velocity um, uh, UEO, which is mu EO times E, right? This looks like it's, it's an impossible equation, right? Unless E is one, but that's U and that's mu. <laughs> so UEO is the velocity of the electroosmotic flow, and that's mu EO times E, right? So the only thing that mu EO, uh, well, mu EO tends to depend on pH, right? Because the more you deprotonate the, the surface of the silica, the higher the charges on the surface and the faster the electroosmotic flow, right? And it's also really the Achilles heel of this uh, technique because electroosmotic flow is variable, unfortunately. So there's, in, in CE instruments, there's a lot, a lot of times between runs, you run a, a you might, um, you will run through some highly, some like uh, pH 14 solution, some strong base, then you'll go back to buffer and you'll run the buffer for a while between runs because you sort of you wanted to fully deprotonate the surface again and then go back to a, a partially deprotonated surface. And it's because the surface is sensitive to contamination, basically. There's contamination effects that can, can cause the surface to lose a little bit of surface charge and, and therefore um, the electroosmotic mobility of the capillary changes a little bit with time, et cetera. So, um, so anyway, this is one of the uh, Achilles heels here, but um, you know, capillary electrophoresis separations look similar, but over time you'll see that a set of peaks will sort of move to longer time because the EOF is changing, right? The EOF is drifting down, right? Then you run base and they'll be real short and then they'll get longer, longer, longer. Run base, they'll get short, they'll get longer. Things like this. Okay, so another enemy of uh, capillary electrophoresis is joule heating, right? And basically, um, as you drive ions, faster and faster through the column, um, then it starts to heat up. And you know, so there's the uh, number of joules per second is the, is the, the power, and that's um, uh, equal to I squared R. R is usually fairly fixed, you know, and it's um, many mega ohms. And then I squared as that goes up, then the, um, the joule heating of the column uh, increases. Now it's, it's not a, you know, it's not a serious problem unless you're seriously trying to improve the separations, right? If you wanna use a high voltage to get a faster separation, then it is the problem, you know? So this is a sort of a, um, I guess I would say, an asterisk, right? Um, unless you're trying to uh, improve the separations, which is exactly what's happening in, in the paper that we're looking at, right? So um, they're using a thin wall capillary. And I imagine that's a pain in the tail. Those graduate students had to suffer because they got this, this you know, it's like, literally like a piece of white hair, you know? It's 
but it's 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 way finer than actual hair, you know. And it's tri and it's tubular. And they have to put that into an uh, into an electrophoresis experiment, and they probably broke a whole bunch of them. And probably, you know, it was horrible. I just predict that. I predict. Okay, so the apparent mobility of an ion. It's the sum of the electrophoretic and the electroosmotic mobility, right? So the, that's the total mobility of the ion, right? Electroosmotic should be more or less constant throughout a run, and the electrophoretic um, uh, will depend on the ion that you're, um, that you're separating, right? So, um, uh, so depending on the, the, the charge of your ion, right, you may actually have to reverse the polarity of your instrument to use to separate it, right? Um, like you like if you're if you're trying to um, separate cations, then then you make the detector end negative. If you want to see only anions, you make the detector end positive, right? So um, uh, but there's always an asymmetry there because the liquid always flows from positive to negative. And so um, most times the electroosmotic flow is larger than the, um, than the um, electrophoretic mobilities of any of the constituents. So if you run it long enough time, you'll see everything elude, even things that are being dragged against the current by the, uh, by the voltage that you apply. Um, okay. So um, blah, blah, blah. I'm not gonna talk about that. Um, peak areas, blah, blah, blah. I'm gonna, I'll delete these. Um, oh goodness. Okay, so um, here's, um, uh, here's two methyl benzoate and benzoate. And then they were dissolved in methanol and injected on this column, right? And um, uh, the two methyl benzoate came out at, you know, I don't know, six minutes. And then the benzoate came out at 5.5 minutes. And the methanol gave a little negative spike there at, you know, at maybe three, you know, 2.7 or three minutes here, right? And, um, the methanol gives a negative spike there because methanol is more transparent than the uh, than the running buffer in this experiment. So when it comes through, a little bit more light leaks out, right? Then when the benzoic acid and the methyl benzoate elute, then there's a positive absorption corresponding to their elution, right? So the difference between benzoic acid and methyl benzoate has to do with their um, uh, with their pKa and their size, right? So um, uh, depending on the uh, pH of the running buffer, um, the uh, two methyl benzoate um, will have a slightly it's slightly more acidic, right? And it's its average charge over time is minus 0.67. The average charge of the benzoic acid is minus 0.5. And therefore, there's a difference in the elution times. Um, so, you know, or the migration time, they call it here. And um, so, uh, what two factors, I'm sorry, what two factors determine the elution times for the Benzoate and the methyl benzoate. Dan. Um, there's pH, but the second factor. Okay, right. So, right, yeah, so there's pH, which determines the charge of the ion, right? And then there's one other factor here, which is size it's all, mobility, then? yeah it's all size and charge right 
the the in this case the chubbier one here uh, eludes takes longer time to elute even though it's more negatively charged. Wait, hold on. Let me think about that for a second. Uh, I don't know what polarity they're using here. So I don't know if this is running against EOF or with, but methanol is first. Right, right. So these are both running against EOF. So the, the EOF is actually um, retarding both of these guys' um, uh, migration through the column. Uh, does that, I'm sorry, I said that wrong, curse me. So the, the migration of benzoic acid, and, of benzoate and methyl benzoate is in the opposite direction as the electroosmotic flow. And I know that because the, uh, the solution is positive. The, the silica wall is negative and the solution is positive. These are anions, right? So they're gonna run the opposite direction. Right. Dr. Carroll? Yes. What would happen if you um, ran your buffer at the same pH as the PKAC should have? Would you have two peaks? Uh, interesting question. So, um, uh, so in this case, uh, the pKa of benzoic acid is 4.20, right? And the average charge is minus 0 0.5, right? And what this is, and this is indicating that there's a relatively fast equilibrium between neutral and negatively charged benzoic acid in this system, right? And that means that you can use on this time scale, on this multi minute time scale, you can apply an average charge to the molecules. So, like, you know, really what's happening is when they, when they protonate, they're like flowing down, going the other way. And then they deprotonate, they speed up, you know, and then, you know, but, you know, and that's actually a kinetic term that's not in the equation here, right? But it, it's true, you know? So, um, but I guess, you know, I've heard different things about the kinetics of protonation and deprotonation. In some cases, it's really slow. But in this case, it must be relatively fast because it doesn't seem to affect these guys terribly much in terms of their bandwidth, you know? But, um, but yeah, so you'll, you only see one. That's the answer to your question because the kinetics of the protonation deprotonation is normally fast. And so um, what pH was this electrophorogram run at? Oh, let me have to pick on somebody. Um, I'm, I'm feeling like I, I have to pick on Kai. Kai, turn on your webcam. Yes. Please, please. Hello. What, what pH was this one run at, you know? Okay, first of all, let's take a poll. If you know, then raise your hand or give me a thumbs up or something. Adam knows, I think. He sort of went like this. He, he raised his hand. How was that a poll? 
<laughs> what? That was, more, that was more of a bait than a poll. <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay. Okay, Richard has a guess. I think Richard knows. But Pauline? Um, I can take a stab at it. All right. Okay. But I just have to say something. This is going to be on both Pauline and Kai's final exam. Final, their final oral exam for their MS. So I'm not going to forget this one. I'm not going to forget. No, neither are you when we get this done. So go ahead, Adam. We don't have a final for. You have a final oral exam. Yes, you do. Okay, I thought you meant like an exam exam. Not for this class, just for your MS. <laughs> so in okay. general. In general, you just need the pH to be greater than your pKa, so that way it's not protonated. Your molecule is not protonated because that would make a charge right. uh, positive, right? Right. I don't. I don't know the actual calculation. Oh, okay. All right. Do you know the Henderson Hasselbalch equation? Oh, yeah. Oh, Doctor Phil, I just have yes. a quick question about this. Where yes. is the? What is the pKa that we would use for the Hasselbalch? Because I, because we have a pKa for the methyl benzoic acid, which is a 3.9, but I don't see one for like, you know how it's like a pKa and then plus the log of the weak acid over or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah so what, what is the middle pKa in the middle part? Like what would yeah. that be? Is it the 420 or the, or I'm confused. Okay, about okay. Well, basically you've got all you need from the Henderson Hasselbalch to solve this, right? Because you, know you know that an acid whose pKa is 4.2 has an average charge of minus 0.5. Oh, okay. Right? So that means that how I many... Got yeah? You got it? Uh, you know yeah, the, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm just going to calculate it. Just, just. Okay, well, I don't need a calculator to do this one. pH equals pKa plus log of H plus over A minus, right? So if the average charge is minus 0.5, then um, how, much of the, how much of the benzoic acid is charged and how much is uncharged? And it has to do with a special type of cream that I like in my coffee. And that cream is called Adam? Half and half. Half and half. Half and half. Exactly. So at pH 4.2, half are charged and half are uncharged. Because the pKa is 4.2, right? That's what that means. And Calvin is so bored, he missed this crucial point. This has been a very boring lecture. No, I didn't. I was trying to um, calculate like the pH using the, the uh, Henderson Hasselbalch, but I just don't know. Like, uh, okay, is. okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm gonna do it for you. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna use my stupid ass fucking document camera thing. Sorry, I used a bad word. I just uh, I'm in a bad mood because um, I don't know why really. I just don't. Uh, so there it is. Um, I'm going to move it up here. Okay. The pH is equal to what? Well, the pH is equal to the pKa plus the log of HA over A minus, right? Check. So the log of HA over A minus is equal to what? Or what is it? A minus is equal to what relative to HA? What is X? X is, what is it, Richard? Thank you. Unmute. Ah, okay. Not quite. Okay. 
So um, if, if the average charge is one half, is minus one half, right? That means that how many of these species are in this form relative to this form? It's a A minus over H A plus A minus equals, that's equal to a half. Is it one? So one. X equals one, exactly. So if we have HA over A minus, that is the log of one, pH equals pKA plus the log of one, which is equal to, uh, therefore, the log of one is zero. So the pH is equal to the pKA. That's, that's, that's just a stupid mathematical trick way of saying that when the pH is equal to pKA, then you, you're just a halfway point in deprotonating something. So you have as many acids as conjugate bases, et cetera. Yeah, cool. All right, moving forward here. So, um, so in this case, there's a pH, it's buffered at 4.2, right? And that means that this is one half um, deprotonated. But the 2-methyl benzoate is a stronger acid, 3.9. And so it's, it's retarded a little bit more relative to the EOF, right? Now, um, what, which of these three uh, migration times that are indicated tell us what the electroosmotic flow is? Uh, yes, it is methanol. And why is it methanol? Uh, because it's neutral. Because it's neutral. Exactly. Excellent. So, um, Lily. Yep. Did you get that? Yeah. Excellent. Ivy? Can you repeat your question before? Yeah, I can totally repeat the question. Thank you. The question was, which of the three uh, peaks indicates the electroosmotic flow? And Lily's going to explain to you which one and why. Methanol, because it's, well, just to reiterate, because it's neutral, it's a known uh, solvent. Mm -hmm. It's neutral. Therefore, uh, does it have um, any uh, electrophoretic mobility? No. Exactly. Electrophoretic mobility is equal to charge <laughs> divided by size, basically. And if the charge is zero, the electrophoretic mobility is? Zero. Zero. Excellent. Good. All right. So now you know how to look at, a, um, at a, a, an electrophorogram and determine, um, you know, what the EOF is and then whether um, the specimens that you're thinking about are moving with or against the EOF, right? So um, species that elute later than the than methanol, I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask uh, Aditya this one. Species that elute later than methanol, do they uh, move with the EOF or against the EOF? EOF is electroosmotic flow. I'm going to guess with. 
And that's all. <clears throat> so, uh, does anybody else want to take a, a shot at this one? Now that it's extremely low hanging fruit? Wait, can you repeat the question? Yes. <laughs> so, the question is Do peaks that elute later than the uh, methanol peak, are they going with the EOF or against the EOF? Oh, they're going, they're going with. No. What? It's against, since you just they're said. Going to, good, Kai, good. Kai got it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you said they're we could going, get it wrong again. And I know, we got two wrong answers. And then Kai said, no, it's going against. <laughs> I love it. So. So, now you're thinking because they're to the right, they're going faster. Are you not, Kenya? But to the right means slower. The, this race is- Yeah, one the they're there for a longer time. So they're migrating for a longer time, right? Right, that's true. But this, this guy comes through just at the electroosmotic flow in two point, you know, in, in like three minutes, right? Then these guys come out like six and seven minutes, right? So they take longer. Therefore, they're going against the flow. If they're going with the flow, they'd come out like this bastard right here. And what is the sign on this uh, molecule that came out here? The sign on this ion is what, Kenya? Positive? Yes because it is going with or against the EOF? With. Exactly. Oh, so is that why the charge is negative? Right. They oh my God, okay, negative. thank you. All right, we got it. We got it. Excellent. We had an aha moment. That's like the first time this entire year that I've had an aha moment in a class. Uh, that's not true. We had a lot in 155 during the spring semester. Okay, good. <laughs> but not this semester. <laughs> oh, geez. You this I'm year. Downhill. I'm going downhill so fast. It's like okay. being on a roller coaster. Okay. All right. So this is just blah, blah. This is just what we said. All right, so you can calculate the stupid electrophoretic mobilities, you know? Da, 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 da. So, I don't know. You can do this shit later. I'm not going to worry about it right now. So, um, uh, let's see here. Okay. Plates are good. That's all this means. So I'm not gonna test you on plates or anything, don't worry. No worry about plates. Um, conducting seating, I don't even know what that is. Okay, so that is all I have on the basics of electroosmotic uh, or of uh, capillary electrophoresis, right? So um, what we're gonna talk about next time is this paper, and I put it, um, in my folder, and then when, when we're done, I'll put it in on Canvas, which is called High-Speed Capillary Electrophoresis Using Thin-Walled Fuselage Capillary Combined with Backscatter Interferometry. We're gonna start talking about this. We'll talk a little bit about what backscatter interferometry is, and then um, uh, we'll talk about the merits of using thin-walled fusilica in this um, context. And, um, And basically what they, they did was they, they detected potassium, barium, magnesium, sodium, lithium, and tris. And they did it all in 30 seconds. So that's pretty impressive. But um, uh, so anyways, we'll look at this paper next time. And I'm actually, um, feeling a little bit more alive than I was an hour ago. I was feeling super tired.
but, um, but I'm going to put all this good stuff onto Canvas for you, as well as um, I'm working on a on a take home midterm for you for um, for that will be due a week from Friday, and um, I'll probably give it to you um, this Friday. But just so you know, what's coming at you. All right, are we good today? Please say yes. Excellent. Uh, okay. Yeah, what's what's going to be on the midterm, Dr. Terrell? Uh, questions. Um, about what? About um, stuff that we talked about. Such as? Such as the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, sixth day, seventh day, and eighth day. Mm, specifically focusing on stuff that we talked about most <laughs> okay i'm sorry i'm just being a jackass here i haven't written it yet i just i just started like the first three questions and what what the thing about making um uh yes i was up super late last night so the thing about making a a take-home midterm is the midterm is super easy to write but it's hard to grade because you've got to read all these answers pretty carefully, right? And so, because I'm going to give you enough space to make a fool of yourself in making your explanation, and so I'm going to I'm going to pick them apart a little bit, okay? And then and then I'm going to turn it in. I'm going to see if you got it off Wikipedia, right? So if you go to Wikipedia, you've got to work on your paraphrasing skills. Right? Because everybody's going to do it. I, I would do it. Shit, I would do it in a heartbeat. But I would paraphrase carefully. And you have to paraphrase accurately, right? Because if you, when you're paraphrasing it, if you mess up the meaning, then I'm going to catch it. So anyway, that's all I got to say on that. So I'm going I'm to let y'all go. Oh, um, uh, yes, Sorry. yes. It's just me again. No. Um, so what is the last thing that like we covered that's going to be on the exam? So yeah, from the beginning, but until like, is it this week or last week or the week before? This week. Okay. So we're gonna, we'll cover CE, but I'll give you questions. The thing is, it's going to be take home, right? And we may even have a conversation about it before we, before we all turn it in, you know? And you know, I'll be, you know, I'm not just going to give you the answers, but I'll try and steer you in the right direction. Okay? Deal? Okay. I promise to be good. I promise to be nice. I promise not to be evil. And, it's, not recording. Uh, it's not recording. I know. I'm recorded. I'm on record saying I'm not going to be evil. <laughs> well, I'm not going to be super evil. Let's put it that way. Just a little bit evil. Just a little bit evil, but mostly good. Okay. Um, Joffrey Thoreau, I have another question. Yes. Sorry, I'm eating candy. Um Oh my gosh. Yes. About the Excel sheet. Yes. When is that is, is that that's due this Thursday, correct? I think so, yeah. I can't yes. remember. I think Friday, it's due Friday. Friday at midnight. Friday oh. at midnight, yeah. Okay. Yeah. When are you yeah, asking for hours, Dr. Terrell? My office hours, they're Tuesday, Thursday uh, from 12 to 1. Okay. But you, can, but you can always get to me. Like Richard jumped right on this and he did everything and he sent me his, his um, spreadsheet and I completely ignored it. <laughs> I do not know why. I don't know why, Richard. I just ignored it. I'm sorry. I just okay. get anxious, you know? And so but I'll take a look at it if you still want. And, and I'm sure it's fine. You know, if you sort of figured out what's going on with Linus, then you're good. It's just, I just want you to go through the exercise of using um, uh, Excel to do a, a multi-variant uh, least squares. That's all. You'll be, you'll be better prepared for the world afterwards. You know? Okay, good. I'm going to shut up now. Okay, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.